Quincy Jones said, there's nobody in the room bigger than the music. And the greats all live by that, and that's why they're so great, you know what I'm saying? And have long careers, not flash in the pan, and are able to work with different people and different genres. So I think that's the single most important lesson is you have to respect the music and you have to check your ego at the door. My name is Trevor Lawrence Jr. I'm a drummer, producer, songwriter, and inventor. My first primary instrument in everything is drums first. So I'm a drummer first. Some of the projects that people may know me from, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Eminem, uh, Alicia Keys, Bruno Mars, Harvey Hancock, Leanne Rimes, and countless uh, sessions and records from a lot of different artists. So we're here at the studio. So this is the V-Drums kit right here. My storage over there, this is my jazz kit. I'm working some stuff out there. The main kit area, this is where I record a lot of the main stuff. This is my sneaker area. This is the most important part of the studio. <laughs> oh, one other thing I want to show you. This is the actual head I played at the Super Bowl that was on the front of the bass drum. The Super Bowl was unbelievable. I mean, leading up to it, you know, we did a lot of rehearsing and you could start feeling it mount. And then we won. <laughs> so, and I'm from here, so I'm born and raised in LA. So it was just a great moment. This is the main cockpit area. It's sitting on my output desk and my output stand right here, which are crazy. Also because I can just pull out the 88 key controller. Composing everything is really, really handy. I love the configuration. There was a lot of thought into it because I want to be able to have a lot of freedom. I have a track open that I've been working on using Ableton Live. That's a loop I made a long time ago, just random, and I heard it, and it just put me in some kind of, it, it, it put me in some kind of way, that drum loop. I was like, okay, I like that. Sometimes when I have a drum thing, I'll turn to arcade, and I'll start skimming through that and see if I, you know, like anything. So I pulled up this in arcade, and I just started, you know, auditioning. That's crazy. That hit me right away. I mean, some people that might sound like noise, but I heard some. I heard a, a pocket in it. You know, I was like, okay, this this will go good with that drum. So it's like, it sounds, sounds very hip hop to me. Because everything is time locked and everything with 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 um, arcade, you know, um, it pretty much locked right in. You know, because it, it locks into whatever tempo you're in. And I love that just chromatic ascending type vibe that I'm hearing. So then I just start filling out stuff around it. Yeah, it's just an additional kick, you know, to go with the sample, with the sequence. And then of course on the bass, I want it to be a live bass. Yeah, cause that's what that key sounded like, so. A lot of times too, I, I, I have sample flows going in my head, head, like cadences, even though I can't predict what somebody's gonna write to or rap, but that will help me sometimes navigate through what, what I'd like to do next. So I'm just hearing this, you know. You know, I have these little, because I'm thinking about, you know, space, something that somebody could actually rap over and just the propulsion and the head nod. And then I'll add some things like this, little, now, that right there, that little sample, that little shaker, that came from Arcade as well. It was maybe not intended to be used like that, but that's the way I chose to use it. So, wherever it is. Let me see. There you go. And then it starts fitting in the track. So you can really carve out Arcade to make it whatever you want. That's one thing I love about it. gives us the vibe. Yep, 
Sorry, guys, I'm looking at my watch, but, you know, that's what we do as producers. <laughs> what I did also is I did a throw-off section so that it doesn't get boring if somebody wants to do a hook or something a little different, and that sounds like this. So this is a note kit, which I really like this bass sound on uh, RK. That's all I was playing the octave. I like the psychology that happens when you have something soft that plays before something hard because it always makes the harder part harder when you listen to it, no matter what volume. So if I just started it like this, I mean, that's dope. But when you start it like this, I'm using hooked. So now you can kind of hear this vocal piece kind of like in the five. And then it's, you know, then it gives you that solid one. And you know, the reality is you can manipulate it. So Oh, so that means that you, there you go. That's what I'm saying. You can make this thing your own and it just becomes very creative and it's just, I just use it however it, it, it feels, you know? I love it. Some people come up from church. I came up from jazz. So when I was 15, I performed with my high school and also our jazz combo at the Monterey Jazz Festival. And a few of us got chosen to perform with Dizzy Gillespie. So I played with Dizzy to, to have that feeling of being on the stage with greatness like that. It really made me feel like, you know, okay, I made it this far. You know what I'm saying? I could keep going. It's the only thing I've ever done. And there's no, oh, the back burner in case. No, 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 no. This is what I do. It's either sink or swim doing this, you know? My story that even got me to Dr. Dre started on the drums. I was working with Dre doing sessions way before any producing or writing. But one day, I decided to bring my rig with an iMac and stuff into the control room and was making tracks when I wasn't sitting behind the drums. And so unbeknownst to me, the engineers had plugged the outputs in so they could hear that. And then I saw the gestures like, what? I'm like, what's what's going on? And then he was like, what's that? And I was like, oh, you can hear this? He was like, oh, I like that. And then, you know, basically I came in the control room and I never left. My first number one song was Crack a Bottle by Eminem and I'm playing live drums on that as well as the programming stuff. And I'm a part of that record, but it started with the drums, right? So your instrument can get you in the room and then from there, it's up to you how you, how you proceed. Drums, I love playing drums. I love doing sessions, but the real true capital is in the publishing and the songwriting. That's our capital. Everything else is work for hire, right? When you're sitting at the drums, um, we're usually looked at as drummers are not the songwriters. They're just there to play the drums. And I have a story. I spoke to one of the most recorded drummers. I won't mention his name because I want him to get embarrassed. I heard stories of him really being prohibited from going into these other rooms and doing some of the hugest songs that are predicated off of his drums. And because they don't want to be profit sharing, he's relegated to just being in the drum room. So I saw that and heard those stories early on and I, and I literally was trying to change that. So I realized, okay, I have to get over this hurdle of people not looking at me like that, but how do I cross that line? Because you get a lot of smiles until it's like, we got to share this. Then <laughs> sometimes it's like, oh, Okay, well, hold on, you know what I mean? So you have to figure out how do you make what you do invaluable? And it's just a thing of thinking ahead. We have a phrase, the aftermath, your ego's not your amigo, right? So we say that all the time. So when, it, when you're a drummer, if you're not the band leader, you're a support role, right? So the whole thing is, how do we make this music the best that it can be? It's not about me. One of the worst things you could do as a new producer is start throwing that, throwing those opinions. Someone asked you, that's different. What do you think about that? 
But if somebody's writing something, man, you should do this. Oh God, that's the worst vibe killer of them all. Cause you don't know where we were going, if we were gonna get exactly to where you were thinking about, cause you never worked with us before. You come into that kind of a situation like that, that's exclusive and you're just, you know, fiending for pictures and this. It's just a weak look. It's a very, very whack look. Just know the room, know your audience, know the crowd you're playing for, know the room you're in, and that will help you navigate through how you're supposed to carry yourself. It's always awkward in the beginning, especially when it's with people you don't know. It's like you're breaking the ice and having a conversation and somebody might do something. It's like, oh, what's that? Or I might do a drum thing or a, a melodic thing or something from output, arcade, whatever. You bring one thing to a session that could spark a thing, that could change the whole vibe. You know, and, and all of a sudden you're like a hero. When I first started bringing this to sessions, oh man, people were like, what's that, bro? Oh my God, it's crazy. And it just changes the, the, the possibility. Okay, so this is my invention, the clap stack. I really wanted something that sounded like a clap, not a trash cymbal. I used it all in my recording at the Super Bowl. During the Kendrick section, you really hear it, you know, super loud. So, uh, you know, look for it. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> Music is selling a feeling, right? So. I just wanna be an advocate and a contributor and a collaborator with that mission and that goal. And whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen before time, neither does anybody else in the room. That's the beauty of making a song. 